All right, guys, let's start with a little story time. Do you see this smoothie in my hand right here? This smoothie ruined my entire morning. So I used the two hours that I was dying on the toilet upstairs to watch through Spider-Man Lotus. Spider-Man Lotus is a non-profit fan-made Spider-Man movie. This was a movie that had a ton of hype around it about a year ago. The internet crowdfunded this movie way past its goal and all the way up to over $100,000. Everybody was convinced that this was going to be a movie to rival the actual Marvel Spider-Man movies. That's just what it was looking like. But that was far from the case. What's funny is that if you go to Spider-Man Lotus on YouTube and watch the video. I'm pretty sure I have the top comment on the video. And all I had said was, wow, that's it. Just wow. And I know this is a little vague, but I don't mean this as a wow. No, this is, this is more like a wow. So I'm here to elaborate a little bit more on my thoughts about this movie and why I think this is one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my entire life. Now, my perception of this movie might be a little, you know, overly negative, but that's because I experienced this movie while ascending to the Avatar state on the fucking toilet. So if I'm just like overly negative in this video, that's why. This guy's name is Warden Wayne, and he plays Spider-Man and Peter Parker in this movie. Now, at the peak of the popularity and hype of this movie, somebody made a new Twitter account called Thunder and put up this tweet. It says, content warning, extreme racism. Is this your Spider-Man? Warden Wayne is so gross, hoping Lotus recast him, and they attach some DMs. First one says, here you go, this that Mexican nigga. Although nigga looks like he bombs shit for fun. I commented, y'all ever make good and funny memes just to flex on blurred vision niggas, and he got mad. Nigga was mean as hell, always saying, I don't know if I can say that without getting demonetized, and saying he had bitches. And I just find this funny because it's like he's randomly inserting nigga into these sentences. Like, none of these sentences require you to even use that word. It's not even like in a context where he would specifically want to say that. He's just inserting it for just the sake of being edgy, I guess. So obviously this post blew up because there was a lot of people really interested in this movie so warden went ahead on twitter and put out an official response to everything he says hello everyone i've decided to come out in regards to certain things from my past i always thought it was better to be above reproach and come forward honestly about my mistakes i made when i was younger this is very hard to say and i feel gross but i'm coming clean i was raised in a homeschool conservative environment in a small town in arkansas where i had to sneak around on the other ipads and computers to use social media my family has always been associated with groups such as the duggars and those values were subsequently pushed onto me i didn't get my own cell phone until i was 18. i was in a bubble where i wasn't aware of how serious it was for me to say these things or these words my ideas of right and wrong were skewed in other words i lived in arkansas saw as a kid and my parents homeschooled me so that's why i say nigger all the time my friend group at the time encouraged and perpetuated these habits all of it quickly became a part of my vocabulary because of the lifestyles around me and i didn't want to be excluded what do you mean excluded did you guys have like nigger meetups where like you all sit in a circle crisscross applesauce and like all say nigger, and then it gets to his turn and they're like come on warden to say nigger with us and then he's like but isn't that wrong and then they're like oh my god warden you're so uncool you don't even say nigger. so then warden was like well i mean i guess i'll try it i don't want to be left out and excluded like what the fuck do you mean excluded that's the biggest cope i've ever heard in my life now this apology as you can guess got a pretty lukewarm response and it seemed like a 50 50 split down the middle some people thought that his apology was a really good example of somebody taking accountability for their actions and others like me thought it was just complete cope so the guy who was making this movie an amateur filmmaker named Gavin and in it he basically explains like yeah this guy screwed up pretty bad but uh it, I mean it's a non-profit movie it's not like we're making any money off of it and like what am I supposed to do basically except be like sorry on his behalf I guess which it's like okay I mean you know nice of him to make his own statement I mean there's not really much he can like do if one of your actors said the n-word like six years ago but it turns out that somebody else went on Twitter and found some old DMs of Gavin saying some crazy stuff like when you find out you're 0.05% black so you can say nigga don't mind if I uh <laughs> black people noise so if anything gavin is just as bad as wooden is so gavin went back to twitter and put out a second statement which for some reason i can't find i guess he just went back and deleted it or something but i did find what i think is like half of it and it says these past few days have been unlike anything i've ever felt or seen before it's the most unprecedented series of events i have ever encountered nothing could have prepared me for it but we're here now I've spent all day trying to gather evidence, get statements, get timestamps, try to distinguish the reality from the fabrication, but I think I'd ultimately just be wasting your time. I'm going to just be transparent with you all. 
and that's all I can do. The gist of it is that he claims that there's a lot of fake screenshots, but they're also mixed in with real ones from back when he was 14 or 15. And he basically just gives the same excuse that Warden gave of that he was like a sheltered kid and didn't know that saying nigger was bad. And now it, so he just said it all over until he got outside and then learned that he's not supposed to say that. It's just the same copy and pasted thing pretty much. But what's even more insane is that the person who plays the green goblin in the movie named John, apparently somebody sent him a screenshot of Warden talking about the blurred vision niggas. And his response was, to be honest, I have more of a problem with the overall sentiment than his use of the word niggas. And it's like, bro. You guys need to stop. You need to fucking stop. So because of all of this stuff happening, on top of the fact that they were extremely overworked, the VFX team quit the movie before they had finished and another team needed to be brought on to finish up their CGI and everything. And it was right after this that the entire script of the movie got leaked and everybody started making fun of it because of how bad it was. The Green Goblin costume that was used in the movie got leaked as well and that caused everybody to make memes because just look at this fucking thing. And it seemed like it was just over for spider-man lotus why watch this movie when everybody making it just says the n-word all the time and the entire script is there for you to just read and it looks like something a child wrote but who's the guy that made the thunder account originally and started this whole thing well he put out this statement and it says my name is matt i'm 15 i'm at gavin con up early 2017 I was only 9 about to turn 10. I looked up to him more than anyone else because I finally had someone who loved comics like me. He was even going to help me make my own Spider-Man movie. He was going to write and edit the whole project. He eventually started to get more followers and changed his platform to GJK Central and started to drop me. I had other friends, but no one who I felt understood me like Gavin. I wanted to be just like him. Having him drop me made me extremely upset. I found these messages from the last couple of years and got upset. I was too young to realize how problematic and toxic he was. I said stupid things in the past, I won't deny it, but like I said, I was very, very young and very easily influenced by those I looked up to. I was heavily influenced by him and thought what he did was edgy and cool. I've grown up in the last couple of years having to watch him become very well known. I wanted to come out and expose him a while ago for different reasons than I am now. I wanted to let everyone know that he doesn't care about those who have been with him since the beginning. I was too scared to come forward because of how strong the Lotus fan base was. I was too afraid to be attacked by everyone for exposing Gavin for something that may be considered silly or petty. So basically what happened was, this guy Matt, when he was a kid, knew Gavin and they planned on making a Spider-Man movie together. So they started working on the movie and then as it got more popular, Gavin distanced himself from Matt because he was just like some kid. So then like five years later, Matt comes back with all of these super old screenshots to try to expose him and then shut down the movie and he leaked the entire script of the movie and all of these screenshots and everything to just try to destroy this. Holy shit. That has to be one of the pettiest things I've ever seen in my life. So after all of this happened, an Instagram account called The Amazing Spider Lab, who was responsible for making all of the costumes for the movie, put up a post that says, the movie is not just about two people, dot dot dot. It took a whole team to make it and we don't deserve to be screwed up this way this didn't have to happen we didn't deserve all this shit we can't even be happy about all our hard work anymore because we're afraid it will always be associated with racism it doesn't have to be this way not all people involved deserve this treatment and the movie deserves to be out there and be seen just having a literal mental breakdown and it's like dude i, I get you the costume designer and everything but it's like bro you were commissioned to make a spider-man costume and you made the costume and then you were paid like you have no further investment in this really and it's not like you made some groundbreaking epic spider-man suit that was never seen before that needs to be seen by the world and the fact that this movie is tied to all this controversy makes it so that your work has been validated and nobody will see your fresh new idea it's like nigga you just made like a normal spider-man suit that you can just like buy from party city like <laughs> like i don't get it so that's pretty much the whole backstory of this movie and after hearing all of that it really seems like the only way that this movie could be redeemed is if it was just the greatest thing ever just some kind of lightning in a bottle movie that's so good that everybody would just watch it and completely forget that this happened but um yeah that, that's not what this movie was or else i wouldn't be talking about it so the film opens with a logo that says gjk which stands for gavin j conop and then it says a film created by Gavin J. Kona. Bro flashed his name two times before the movie even started. And it's like, dude, he, he must be super confident in this movie. Like this shit must be lightning in a bottle. Then we cut to some stock footage overlooking New York City during the sunset while Spider-Man gives some narration. But wait, wh where have I seen this before? I knew it! I knew it! I knew it! I'm, I'm too much of a nerd. I'm too much of a nerd. They need to nerf me. 
They need to nerf me. So yeah, a really great start to your movie, in my opinion. Just use some generic stock footage that has already been used before in other movies instead of just go to New York yourself and buy a drone and film the city. And then he keeps just yapping about nothing while it cuts to other drone shots of New York City that I swear to God I've seen in other movies, but I just can't put my finger on it. Then we really get to see where that $100,000 budget went and it, it wasn't into this car like look at this this entire scene is cgi all of it bro the cutscenes in batman arkham asylum look better than this obviously a budget as small as one hundred thousand dollars isn't that much to just rent out a street in new york and just drive a car down it really fast and film it for this scene so my question is why not just exclude the scene from the movie if putting it in means it has to look like some little big planet graphics and i like how the movie focuses on the license plate of this car for like five minutes straight i didn't slow down the footage or anything it's actually focusing on the license plate for this long and i guess you're supposed to scratch your head and be like oh uh t-a-s oh uh, the the amazing spider-man wowie oh my god wow what an easter egg this movie's gonna be amazing meanwhile i can imagine a car that i saw 15 years ago and it looks better than this car does in this movie and then spider-man swings past this sign and there's a speedometer that says too fast even though like the sensor is on the other fucking side it's not measuring the speed of anything behind it what is happening so after the groundbreaking TASM Spider-Man reference on this license plate that isn't even a New York license plate. It doesn't even look like an American license plate. Like I've I've never seen a I've never seen a plate that looked like this before. We finally meet up with these three guys. They parked the car in this alleyway for some reason because they felt like it, I guess. And then the three guys get out of the car and then stand parallel to each other for some reason. Before Spider-Man webs two of them and pulls him toward him while this guy's like, what? Whoa! And then it switches to a first person view of the guy in the middle as spider-man uses the other two guys to the left and right as leverage to swing into him and kick him i may be nitpicking a lot here right but so let's say he grabs these two guys with the webs and he uses them as a leverage to pull himself forward wouldn't what would it when he pulls his arms back they would just fly forward towards him right like this would only work if he was using like a wall or some stationary object as leverage not something that when he pulls the webs back they get pulled toward him because there's nothing for him to pull off of as leverage to propel himself towards the guy and it's all made even worse by spider-man's dialogue here as you guys know spider-man is known for making like corny jokes and quips and stuff but this movie goes really really overboard with it to the point where it just doesn't even seem realistic like somebody would even speak like this at all all right fellas not all at once i can only sign so many autographs all right look if you turn yourselves in i might throw in a collectible item courtesy of yours truly going once going twice all right well suit yourselves and it's just like yeah Oh, like, oh, man. Oh, my God. This is a tra- it's a tragedy, bro. It's so bad. It's so fucking bad. It kind of reminds me of an impression of Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man. I feel like that's the closest thing I can really compare the way this Spider-Man acts. But even Andrew Garfield wouldn't say anything that- overly corny if you guys turn yourselves in you know i'll add in a free collectible item you know courtesy of yours truly going once and going twice like 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 oh <laughs> what makes it even worse is that all of the professional spider-men that you see in the real marvel movies they are very expressive when they talk because obviously spider-man is wearing a mask that covers up his whole face it's not like batman where you can like see him scowl and, and frown or even smile in spider-man his whole face is covered so that's why they try to come up with creative ways to get him to show expressions because he's a very expressful character like in the tom holland movies they make his eyes open and close and andrew Garfield Spider-Man didn't have the opening and closing eyes as far as I know but he made up for it by being super expressive and almost like acting with his body as he talked. Warden doesn't do either of these things at all. He kind of just idles there and it's just extremely stiff 
especially since the camera is also being held perfectly still and it isn't moving at all. It's just some still close-up shot of Spider-Man's expressionless face. You might as well just put a cardboard cutout there of him as he's like going once, going twice. It just doesn't work. Also like how we're never even given an idea of what these guys even did. As far as we know, they were just speeding and not obeying traffic laws. They didn't steal anything. They didn't hurt anybody. We didn't see any of that. We just saw them driving really fast. Cut to a super close-up shot of Spider-Man's eyes for some reason as he looks at the roof of the car to see a supervillain named the Shocker standing there. And then we cut back to his eyes again before the Shocker just has some type of Parkinson's spasm and shoots electricity at them. And then they have some of the worst dialogue I've ever heard. No. What? What are you wearing? It's my Shocker suit. <laughs> Your Shocker suit. That's what you're calling? Yeah. Wow. Did you come up with that yourself? <laughs> Real clever, buddy. <laughs> One thing I don't understand about this supervillain named the Shocker and the three henchmen that are with him is, you know, this all could have been avoided if they would have just brought like firearms with them. This version of Spider-Man doesn't really seem that powerful. I'm not gonna lie. Like what what's gonna happen if you just shoot him with a machine gun? Like what if all three of you guys just have assault rifles and you just like spray him instead of having this dude sit on top of a car with like these super choreographed lightning blast moves. Like what is this? He's just standing there like just shaking and convulsing. I, I just don't get it. Like why does he need to do this in order to shoot the lightning? This is just a downgrade from using a gun. You would be better off just using a gun to shoot spider-man so as the shocker is shooting spider-man and he's dodging the lightning blast that guy that got kicked in the face and knocked out 30 seconds ago is now starting to wake up and he's like what uh, what's going on this is the kind of acting that you would find in a black and white silent film from the 1940s nobody actually acts like this dude so he turns to the right to his buddy who is knocked out on the ground and he reaches into his pocket and pulls out a pistol so they did have guns the whole time why didn't they just shoot him as they got out of the car then oh i know because they had to walk out in unison and then stand parallel to each other and listen to spider-man be like oh i'm giving out collectibles uh going once going twice and if they just shot him instantly he wouldn't be able to say that spider-man continues to dodge the lightning blast from the shocker and shoots a web at the guy with the gun's face and he gets knocked out a second time and then this guy appears behind him out of nowhere with a knife and then starts charging him where did he come from when did this guy get over here? Was he just standing there the whole time? Did Spider-Man kill him and then he respawned over there? So this guy with the knife charges Spider-Man and while the Shocker conveniently doesn't shoot at Spider-Man at all, he does some of the worst looking fight choreography I've ever seen. Oh my god, Gavin, you got it all wrong. Bring the camera back so I can actually see what's going on here. What are you zoomed in on? So Spider-Man is about to get stabbed by this guy's knife. So he grabs his arm and then thrust it downward which makes the guy let go of the knife for some reason and then it goes flying he obviously just let go of the knife on purpose there's no way that doing this would make him let go of it then spider-man puts his hand on his chest and pushes him forward and unfortunately it seems like warden wasn't flexible enough to do an actual roundhouse kick so he does like this half cartwheel looking thing where he kicks him with like a bent leg and it sends him flying and it just looks all wrong it doesn't even look like that kick has enough force to it to make him flip over like that he obviously just did a cartwheel right after spider-man kicked him and i'm expected to believe this kick made him flip over like that maybe it would look a lot more believable if gavin could film anything except for a close-up shot like look at this why does the movie look like it's cropped he won't back up so Spider-Man gets shot in the chest by one of the Shocker's lightning bolts, and it sends him flying backwards, but doesn't really seem to do that much damage. Which, as I said, this is a downgrade from just shooting him with a gun. You just sent him flying backwards. A bullet would have just pierced through him and actually hurt him. So Spider-Man says some more ridiculous dialogue that I'm not even going to show you before he webs Shocker's gloves so that he can't shoot any lightning at him. Not like he could just shoot the lightning anyway and it would break through the webs. I guess the webs are just made of steel or something. And then he just uppercuts him. 
and and that's it and once again it seems like gavin wants to capture every single pore on the actor's faces because he doesn't know how to give any of them any kind of personal space i think the reason he has these shots extremely zoomed in is because the more you zoom them out the more you have to actually show and the more work you have to actually do because think about it if the camera was more zoomed out to where you can actually see the shocker being uppercut it would mean that the shocker would have to get uppercut and then he would have to like fake do a cartwheel or they would have to have some effect for him getting knocked down maybe and gavin didn't want to do any of that even though he had one hundred thousand dollars to work with and so far has spent about 20 bucks so gavin just zooms straight into spider-man's bicep as he uppercuts a man off screen nice now i hope you guys like that fight scene because it's the only one in the movie that's it that's the only fight scene in the movie now at this point you might be wondering well who's the antagonist of this movie who's the bad guy? Because like, if there's no more action and there's no more fighting and this is the only fight scene, then who could the antagonist be? The answer is there's not one. There is no bad guy. There's no villain that Spider-Man has to stop. There, there's nothing. There's no threat. There's no stakes. There's nothing. The Shocker isn't the main antagonist of this movie. It's not the Green Goblin. It's not Venom. It's nobody. There isn't one. The rest of the movie is just drama. When I first watched this movie, I thought that they had invented a new villain called the Lotus. Or maybe the Lotus is the name of some evil gang or faction that Spider-Man has to take down. But no, there is no villain. There's no bad guys. They should have named this movie Peter Parker Lotus, not Spider-Man Lotus. Because we don't really even see Spider-Man that much in this movie. It's just Peter Parker crying and Harry Osborn crying and Mary Jane crying, and then the credits roll. So now that you're aware of that, let's get back to the movie. So after Spider-Man defeats the Shocker and his other henchmen, we cut to some more establishing shots of New York City. Even though we haven't changed location, and the time hasn't changed. I, I don't know, just, just throw in some fucking shots in New York, I guess, why not? We gotta get the movie to exactly two hours long. Or I don't know, the aesthetic of it, I guess. So just, just pat it out. You can't even tell where in New York they even are from the establishing shots. They're called establishing shots because they're supposed to establish the location and the time. These shots don't establish anything. All right, I mean, we got a train, uh, the city at night. Uh, we're in New York, I guess. Nice. So Peter Parker meets up with his friends Harry, Gwen, and MJ as they're leaving a play or some type of movie, I guess. And he got there late because they're leaving, meaning they already saw the movie and he wasn't even there. I'm gonna assume that Peter was just stopping crimes as Spider-Man for the whole rest of the day and that he didn't just stop the shocker and then head over here. But even if that's the case, why are his friends, who are obviously wearing some of the fakest wigs I've ever seen in my life, mad at him for being late? Especially Gwen, who is pretty much his girlfriend at this point. Doesn't she know that he's spider-man you can just assume that he was late because he was doing something more important than watching a movie with you is she that much of a dickhead i, I tried to get her on time i, I really did but your bike was stolen you stuck at the bugle you're studying late something like that peter what a great actor but I just stuck at the studying like, like like what the fuck he was busy being spider-man and saving people's lives so instead of being happy that her boyfriend finally showed up she's instead extremely upset at him that he's late and she turns around to just go home and then this sad background music starts playing that sounds like it's ripped straight from one of those copyright free emotional sad piano music hour long videos on youtube because i'm supposed to be like oh man but i want them to have a happy relationship and oh peter's always late but his girlfriend is just like a piece of shit You might have noticed that that was really loud and that wasn't me editing it or anything you can look at the audio track right here and just see how bad the mixing is like did gavin write this piece of music himself and he was just so proud of it that he felt like you had to hear it why is it so fucking loud so it turns out that all of this is a flashback and gwen in the present is actually dead she got caught in between a fight of spider-man and the green goblin and ended up dying so Peter walks Gwen back home and has a ring on him, which I guess he's going to use to propose to her, but decides that it's not a good idea. So he puts the ring away and then walks away and then another intro sequence starts where Gavin just, <laughs> just flashes his name again. 
Then we get a couple credits for the actors before Gavin flashes his name again a fourth time. And I like how he lets it linger longer than all of the other credits. Even after the screen starts to fade to black, he just tries to leave his name on there for as long as he can. Just so fucking lame. After that, we get a scene of Spider-Man sitting on a bed, looking like he just got back from his first date with an alt girl. And he's sitting there watching the news, but the news reporter doesn't sound anything like a news reporter at all. Like, like this isn't how news reporters talk. According to the autopsy report, it occurred around 5 a.m. this morning. Sources say they saw Spider-Man fleeing the vicinity, leaving Osborne dead on the scene with the blade wounds and several scars. News reporter literally sounds like one of those horror YouTubers who read scary true stories from Reddit. News reporter goes on to explain that Harry Osborne and Gwen have been found dead inside of an abandoned warehouse and that they saw Spider-Man fleeing the scene. Which means that this scene is kind of pointless because we already know this and we've already been told it in this scene before. Because Peter has been narrating over pretty much majority of the flashback section talking about how they died. So I wonder why they didn't just decide to start the movie right here. It would be so much better if we just chopped everything before this point and just had the opening credits here and then the movie began like this. After the news report finishes, it fades to black and then we get a third title sequence where it says Spider-Man Lotus created by Calvin Kona. This movie is just a mess. It's just, it's just a mess. In the next scene, Peter Parker is at a cemetery in front of Gwen's grave when MJ comes up to talk to him. And Peter just goes super out of character and just acts like a total asshole to her. And it's like, I get he's mourning the death of Gwen, but Peter Parker would never be this mean to anybody. Not even symbiote Peter Parker when he had the black Venom suit was this mean to people. This is just another level and it just feels so weird and out of character for him. You don't care about people like me and Gwen. She didn't live life like it was a constant game. Maybe if you took a second to think, you could have learned a thing or two from her. So leave. I hate to ruin your fun. So obviously MJ's feelings are hurt pretty bad and she turns around to leave. But before she goes, she gives Peter a letter. And the letter is from this kid's mom who says that her son is terminally ill and is about to die soon and his final wish is to meet Spider-Man. So MJ does know that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. So then why was she hounding him about being late to the movies earlier? I don't know. I don't, it doesn't make any sense. I don't know. But anyway, here, have some more New York City B-roll to establish the same location and the same time frame that we're already in. But seriously, look how long this stays on screen for, dude. It's just, I, I mean, it's New York in the evening. Uh, it's pretty cool, man. Uh, we're still in New York and it's still the evening. Oh, okay, finally, Jesus. You know what's crazy is that I think that B-roll is actually in slow motion. Like, they slowed it down to make it take longer. Because look at the frame rate in the B-roll compared to the next shot of Peter walking. I didn't edit this or change this, like, I swear to God. It looks choppier than the next shot of him walking. And I think that's because they just slowed down the footage without, like, editing it or trying to change the frame rate or anything like that. So it's the same frames just being played slower and it's just choppy because they wanted the B-roll to be longer for some reason. Turns out where Peter was going was back to his apartment where his roommate is Harry. And it doesn't seem like Harry is taking his father's death in the most healthy way. So Peter confronts him about this and they get into like another crying, arguing match. That's two of those so far. One with Peter and MJ and now one with Peter and Harry. Oh my god, it's two people who want two different things and they're, and they're crying and yelling at each other and there's sad music in the back. Can I have my award now, please? And in every please, you're one to talk about abandoning people. It has nothing to do with this. It's about Gwen. Do you realize that? A award, a award, award please, please, award please, award. So Peter literally says to the man whose father just died that he's mad at him for disappearing and leaving MJ with nobody to hang out with. So Harry is like, dude, you disappeared too. Like you can't say anything about disappearing. So then Peter is like, well, this isn't about your dad. This is about Gwen. You're not allowed to disappear. You have to stay around and hang out with me and MJ to keep us happy, slave. Like, I'm serious. That's, that's basically the gist of what he says. And it's like, like, damn, Peter, <laughs> my God. So. Obviously, after this, Harry gets mad and grabs his stuff and leaves. So what Peter does is he goes and gets out a laptop and then starts watching through videos of some of the friend group's happiest moments with Gwen. And it goes on for like 10 minutes. And it's just more of that 
super overreaching, overly emotional award bait you always find in short independent films like this. It just cuts from a close-up of the computer to a close-up of Peter's face trying not to cry, back to a close-up of the computer, and then back to a close-up of his face. It just keeps going on and on for like 10 minutes, and there's no reason for us to be here. We're not progressing the story, we're not developing characters, we're just seeing the past of characters and those past teach us nothing about them that we didn't already fucking know. Only thing that there is to learn from this 10 minute long snooze fest of a scene is Peter Parker is sad that Gwen is dead. That's it. We already know that. This isn't progressing the story at all. We're not making any progress. Why is this in the movie? After this, we cut to Harry and see where he went after he left Peter's house. And he's on the streets of New York. And he's just, he, I mean, he's, he's walking. Um, he's still walking. This whole scene is just him walking, isn't it? Oh my fucking god. It's just Harry Osborn walking, and then he's riding a train, and then he's getting off the train, and then he's walking, and he's still walking, and he, he's walking, and he's standing there, and then he's looking off in the distance, and he, he's watching fucking cars. I don't think you guys understand how slow this, this all is. That whole sequence I just showed you in a couple seconds of Harry just walking down the streets of New York, that is in six times speed. That is six times as fast. This is as fast as that actually is. This is the normal speed of the movie. Look at this. Do you know how fucking boring this shit is to watch? It's just Harry just walking with no dialogue as sad music plays. This is the this is one of the most boring movies I've ever seen in my life. If this was in a movie theater, I would have fell asleep. I would have actually fell asleep. After the whole sequence with Peter watching his videos of his friends on his computer, and then after that, Harry just walking. I would have fallen asleep. I, I kid you not, I'm dead serious. I'd rather just read this story as a book, honestly. And I know movies are considered to be like a higher tier up from books nowadays, where it's like, you know, we get movie adaptations of books, but it's like, no, I want a book adaptation of this movie. Because if this was a book, it would just say, Harry Osborn walks. And then I could just see that sentence and read it and then it's fucking over. It doesn't last five minutes. Because that's it. There's nothing more to add here. If it was a book, it would just say, Harry Osborn walks. How do you take what would be one sentence in a book and drag it and just drag it and milk it until it's like a six, seven minute long scene? I forgot this was a Spider-Man movie. Like we haven't seen Spider-Man for about 40 minutes at this point. We're 50 minutes into the movie and we haven't seen Spider-Man since we were like, I don't know, seven, eight minutes in. Like what is happening? After Harry Osborn walks, it cuts to Peter Parker now suited up as Spider-Man for the first time in an hour as he sits on the top of this bridge while it rains. And this was very obviously just CGI. Why couldn't you just get Warden to wear the suit and then just like sit there as you pour water on him? in front of a green screen like that probably would have been easier and cheaper than making this out of cg i don't get it after this we get another establishing shot before it cuts to a scene of mj standing on the balcony outside of some party smoking a cigarette when flash walks up to her and he starts asking her questions about if she's okay because apparently she looks pretty sad and she goes on to tell him that harry and peter have completely disappeared and now she's alone so flash uses this as an opportunity to basically just glaze peter as hard as he possibly can and explain why he's so cool for no reason at all just because you know i can't believe i'm saying this but i was always a little bit jealous of him <laughs> he's always somehow getting looks from gwen liz or you i know you <laughs> It was early sophomore year, and, well, for a guy his size, he could throw a solid punch. Peter and his aunt helped me out a lot. Probably more than they should have. It just goes on and on 
and on this man just stands there and compliments peter parker for 10 minutes straight around this time is when peter finally makes it to the kid's house the one that's terminally ill and his final wish is to meet spider-man so he gets there and meets the kid and sees that his whole room is decorated with spider-man memorabilia now in a lot of other reviews that i've seen people make on this movie they call this scene very good and wish there was more of this and that the rest of the movie basically wasn't there and we just had this scene this is considered to be the highlight of the movie and what the whole thing should have been about but i disagree and think it's fucking stupid here's why majority of this spider-man memorabilia was created before this version of spider-man was even born this comic looks like it was made in the 80s or 90s how does this exist if spider-man it's like 20 and it has only been Spider-Man like five years ago. If Spider-Man started freshman year of high school and he was 15, that's like the earliest he can start. Then how does all of this memorabilia exist? How is there a cartoon of Spider-Man that came out in the 70s playing on the TV? Right next to a 20 year old Spider-Man. Let's say that Peter started being Spider-Man freshman year because that's the earliest he could really start. Let's say he was 15 when he began. Which is still being a bit generous. It's more likely he started when he was 16 or 17. I'm positive it would take him about 2-3 to three years to become a household name to the point where the average person across the country, let alone the entire world, knows who he is. So let's say he reaches that point when he's 18 years old you're telling me all of this shit was made the pillowcases the cartoons the comics all of it was made in two years or less we have multiple comic book series that ran for hundreds of issues we have multiple cartoon series we have all this shit all this shit came out within two years fuck yourself no, it didn't. This has to be the stupidest scene I've ever seen in my life. And I don't know how anybody working on this movie didn't realize this super simple fact that I noticed within like 30 seconds. Later in the scene, Spider-Man and this kid sit down to play a Spider-Man video game together for the Nintendo 64, a console that came out before spider-man was even born awesome also you would really think that this kid would be a lot more excited to see spider-man this is his greatest idol like his hero and he's been collecting his memorabilia pretty much his whole life i'd assume and he finally sees him and he's just like hey bro you collected all of this it's every newspaper that the Daily Beagle ever wrote about you. Another question that I have that could just be me looking too far into it is if this movie is the canonical real world and all of the events like Spider-Man stopping the Green Goblin and Gwen dying and him killing Venom and everything happen in the canonical real world, then what happens in the comics? I guess the comics tell the same story as the real world I, I don't know. So Spider-Man keeps playing this game with this kid as they talk about some of Spider-Man's past adventures. Before Spider-Man puts the controller down and suddenly gets up and then tells the kid that he's not the hero that he thinks he is and that he's made a lot of mistakes and that he needs to go and that this is wrong. I just think you're looking at me like someone that I'm not. I don't understand. I know, you're just a kid. I can't do this. I'm sorry. Wait, Spider-Man! Spider-Man! So Spider-Man just completely crushes this dying child's hopes and dreams, walks out past his mom to the front door when she stops him. Then she tells his mom that he thinks that I'm somebody that I'm not and I'm actually like a gooby wooby. And she basically just says to him, just pretend like you're not and then go back because like my son needs hope. And he's like, yeah, you're right. I'm Spider-Man. And he turns around and goes back in there. So after he goes back, they continue to play video games and hang out and talk about Spider-Man's adventures. For the rest of the day, the kid asks Spider-Man what his true identity is, so he takes off his mask and shows him, then they hug one last time before he leaves. Harry and MJ are waiting for him, and then they both apologize to him for being mean. And that's the end of the movie. I'm, I'm serious, that's it. It's over. Created by Galvin J. Conop, by the way. I feel like the best analogy I can really use to describe this movie is this screenshot from Spongebob right here. On the outside, it looks like an outstanding movie for being made with only a $100,000 budget. And I can obviously see why people crowdfunded this, especially after seeing the trailers and seeing the Spider-Man suit. It just looks very interesting. And if you're a Spider-Man fan, you probably can't help but donate money to this thing or at least check it out. But when you actually watch the movie, there is no Spider-Man in it. Spider-Man only appears for maybe 10 to 15 percent of the movie and all of the rest of it is just people arguing and crying and then people walking and just establishing shots of new york city and it's just nothing on the inside it's just sludge i obviously don't expect this movie to be on par with the marvel spider-man movies even though galvin on twitter when the movie was being made insisted that it was going to be i just feel so unfulfilled 
and unsatisfied at this movie. I feel like no progress was made from the beginning of the movie to the end. We're just in the same spot that we began. No characters really grew. We didn't really learn anything new about any of them. We didn't stop some threat or defeat some villain. All of the characters just kind of existed and we just kind of got to see them. I hope what I'm saying makes sense. Like no villain was defeated, no threat was prevented. I don't feel that complete feeling that I usually feel after I watch a movie with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Completionist satisfaction of like, okay, wow, we're done. That was such a great adventure. There was a problem and the characters solved it and now things are fine. Now I was debating if I wanted to throw this onto the bad movies tier list because this is a fan film and it was made with a fraction of the money that a lot of these other movies were made with. But after thinking about it and seeing some of the other tweets that Gavin made talking about how this movie is meant to compete with all of the other Spider-Man films and be like a correct take, a correct comic book take on Spider-Man, why don't we just throw this thing on the tier list with the other movies? So far we have The Equalizer 3, Morbius, The Suicide Squad, Madam Web, Megamind 2, Imaginary, Highlander, Replicas, and Highlander 2. Now, this is one that I had to think about for a while. This wasn't an easy ranking for me at all because this movie has some really bad things in it. Like, none of the other movies on this list just have scenes where a character just walks around New York City for like five, six minutes straight with no dialogue. None of these other movies have acting that is this bad, really, except for a few of them, except for like, except for, I don't know, maybe the Highlander movies. None of these films really have CGI that's worse than this movie except for like replicas not counting the Highlander movies because they're way older I really don't think it's that harsh to put this after replicas as the second worst movie I've ever taken a look at on this channel terrible CGI the horrible story where it doesn't progress and nothing even happens the fact there's only one fight scene and in that fight scene there's like Looney Tunes acting where people are like oh, whoa, whoa the fact that in this movie we have to watch Peter watch videos for 10 minutes straight and then watch Harry Osborn walk for 10 minutes down a city street. I don't think it's too harsh to call this the second worst movie I have ever watched in my life. Thank you guys so much for watching. I, I know I haven't posted a video in a while. I've just been super busy. I don't know. Leave a comment about what movie you want me to talk about next, and uh, I'll see you guys later.